Hello everybody, welcome to Bramski Vlogs. I'm Matt Brammel. Thanks to everybody who's watching this video. Be sure to like the video, to subscribe to the channel and also leave a comment. It's going to help grow the community and also it does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. So we are back today with another ski chat and I really think this is going to be quite an interesting one because we are now just a little over three weeks left until the Brexit deadline. And with no deal finalised as of yet, um, naturally, there is quite a lot of uncertainty for many businesses and workers, especially if you are working within the travel industry. A petition has been launched uh, by a group known as Seasonal Businesses in Travel, otherwise known as SBIP. Uh, the campaign called Save Our Travel Jobs urges the UK government to protect British citizens' ability to work in the EU for short periods without the need for a visa or a work permit. Now, I'm delighted today to be joined by a member of SBIT, uh, Diane Palumbo, and who has agreed to come on and uh, discuss things further. So, uh, Diane, thanks for coming on. Pleasure, pleasure. It's a, it's a wonderful break from my day-to-day -day worries about whether there's going to be a deal or not. Yeah, well... I, I, yeah, well, listen, hopefully we're going to put the world to right in the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so first of all, just tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. OK, I've got two hats. So I'll deal with the one that perhaps people are most familiar with is for the last 20 years. And when I say that, it, it sounds as if I'm speaking about somebody else. Uh, I've been sales and marketing director at Ski World, which is independent um, tour operator which has had a large portfolio of chalets as well as apartments and, and some hotels. In following the referendum result in 2016, um, a group of us tour operators decided to band together because we could see straight away that if our relationship with the EU was going to change, it was likely to be affecting not just the finances of tour operators, but actually the employment practices as well. So now SBIT, seasonal businesses of travel, as you rightly said, numbers about 200 companies. And I'm one of the founding members along with the MD of Ski World. Um, and I'm the spokesperson. So often when I'm called for radio or TV interviews, I have two hats. Now on a personal level, you know, I come from the background <laughs> that I think very many people perhaps watching this do, that I finished university and decided to do ski seasons because I thought it was ready a year out, how little did I know, and about four years later after having done back-to-back -back winter and summer seasons, I realised it was the most amazing work and our overseas manager, who's still overseas at the moment, says that doing seasons is the most incredible finishing school. So like a lot of people, I, I, I didn't attach an automatic value in terms of future employment to what I've been doing, which, let's face it, was budgeting, managing guests, and we all know that managing the public is a challenge. Yeah. Logistics, uh, disasters, coach crashes, um, chalets burning down, you know, all the range of things. Um, and in the summer, I was working on a windsurfing and sailing program for mainly school kids. Um, came back to the UK thinking, right, I'm going to get a proper job, but I was actually shocked at how my problem solving abilities and my ability to deal with the public was um, streets ahead and that's not to be arrogant in the least because I'm flawed in so many other ways but it was streets ahead many of the people that I left behind in the UK who'd gone on to graduate training programs and done other things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I used to say when I was introducing Ski World to the new, as it was then, around 400 people that would work do seasonal work for us in the winter was do not devalue this work. Do not write it up your CV. Stand in front of your future employer and name those skill sets that you've employed. So um, yeah, that is probably that experience has led me and plenty of others to head up travel companies now and that's my story, if you're still awake. Tell us a little bit about um, the organisation's functions and aims. Well, we started in 2016, really wanting to oppose Brexit. Uh, what we felt was very many of the intricacies of our leaving the EU had just not been voiced. 
and there we are, a multitude of companies based in travel, uh, knowing that outbound travel from the UK in 2015 or 16, 2016, contributed 34.3 billion pounds to the UK economy. That's in the UK. And what we felt was much of the debate around Brexit centred on car manufacturing and was Toyota going to stay in this country and, you know, around fishing, which I'm, you know, is still a subject of debate. But the travel industry, because it seems to be associated with holidays, which people think are dispensable, I don't know, it, it didn't seem to be getting the same coverage. So what we felt when we, we found it in 2016 was that we could really try and highlight those issues to perhaps see moving forward that either a very, very soft deal could happen, could we oppose it, could we really inform politicians and the public as to what was going to happen when you lose your right to healthcare in France, which is what's happening, when you can't transport your staff or your money over easily. And we've got this gravity issue in economics, which is you always trade most with the country that's the closest. You know, so we may have this press announcing we've got a deal with Estonia, but Estonia is not on our doorstep, you know, mm. France is. So that's how we started. But actually, as things snowballed, what we realized was we couldn't do anything about a, a soft deal. What we needed to do was to argue for um, some preservation of the ability of young people to, to temporarily cross over and gain this work experience. And I'm doing that with both hands because, you know, there are tour, incoming tour operators in the UK who do exactly what we do, but the other way around. And what the UK economy gains is that it becomes a more desirable destination for groups of French people coming over if they know they've got a native speaker who's looking after their group as they're doing a coach tour around the UK, for example. So seasonal business is, is very unique in that we have these military operations that expand and contract around holiday times, both in the winter and the summer. And our ability to do that efficiently has been one of the main reasons that the industry has grown to that level of 34.3 billion contribution to the economy. Mm. And it's because we don't carry heavy costs outside of those peak seasons that expansion and contraction delivers value to the customer. And the better value the customer has when they're purchasing holiday, the more holidays they purchase. Mm. And so the industry has grown on that. So yeah. what, we, what we started to do was to try and keep that argue for, with politicians on both sides to keep that cross movement going. It's a really interesting point that you make actually about um, uh, the travel industry being overlooked in the sense that for many people they think oh it's just about a holiday and as you're alluding to there it's it's not that it's not that that simple it's the the billions that it contributes to economies across the continent it's the hundreds of thousands of businesses um, and staff that that there are employed every single year, and and of course the opportunities and the skills that that provides. So, moving on from that, then let's talk about the petition which you guys have have launched. Um, I explain how the petition has come about, and also why why now. I think two two reasons was you know at every level. Um, the pandemic is damaging the economic prospects of 18 to 34 year olds disproportionately. It is the group that are suffering the highest number of redundancies, the biggest cuts in training, it, it, and that age group, which it, it's the future of our economy, it's the skill set which underpins us for the, the new future that we've got. So you cut that investment uh, at your peril. Uh, in 2016, we estimated there were 25,000 people in our sector working in the EU, and most of those are of that age group, and a very high number of those are posted overseas to work for a period of time, you know, and come back. So what we felt was, uh, how do we get those people's voices heard? And statistics get you so far with journalists, 
But if you've got something like a petition that's gone from 10,000 to 16,000 signatures, which is what we are at the moment, and still hoping for more, we want to hit the magic 20. So if you're listening to this, go to Save Our Travel Jobs and sign. And we've had over a thousand people write to us with the stories of what doing seasonal work has brought them in their lives and, and careers. Over a thousand stories. Uh, just showing the contribution that's made. So what we want to do is really, really quickly in these final hours of this deal is to highlight the, the voices of people who perhaps just because they work in or around the travel industry or they're that age group just have not been heard. Mm. You know, So that was the purpose of the petition really and we've got hours and days to go. So if you haven't signed it, please sign it now. Um, I'm in contact with the BBC, ITV, most of the national newspapers um, just trying to get publicity for that. Uh, you, you told me, I mean, th this petition in particular has gained a lot of traction in the last couple of weeks. I know it's been circling around a lot of the Season Air Facebook groups in particular, which are a huge commun community uh, bases. But um, as you've just touched on, it, it's grown, gained wider attraction. And I, I seem to remember you saying to me that um, the guys from Ski Sunday had interviewed you as well. Is that correct? Okay. Alluding to, to it, I don't know if it's going to be broadcast. Um, I don't know what format it's going to take exactly. I haven't seen the final edits. But Ed Lee, in particular, was saying a subject that was close to my heart. You know, I'm old enough to have started my seasons in the 80s. And we had um, a section on our, on our manifest for title. And it wasn't just Mr. and Mrs. Mm. And in those days, skiing was the preserve of the wealthy. Those are the people that I dealt with. And what I saw in, in the 20 years that I've worked in the industry is a, an absolute democratization of that. That the people that we worked with and I met at the beginning of their seasons came from all over the UK. I've just provided some statistics to BBC Wales about the, the contribution that outbound travel makes to the Welsh economy. And I'm thinking, gosh, I know people that work for us who are native Welsh speakers. That, you know, that was not the case in the 80s. It, it wasn't at all. So, you know, when people say that, I feel very defensive because the other thing is that companies based all around the UK, travel companies, we employ IT people for our reservation systems. You know, we send out work to an ex seasonaire an ex uh, ski world person, Kate, if she's listening, who's based in Manchester. You know, so all of the spends that we make with customers who are who are paying for their holidays goes all over the UK. It is, and it supports that level of economy. You know, the the latest figures from 2019 were saying the contribution of outbound travel actually exceeded motor retail sales. Wow. That's enormous. That's enormous. So, you know, the, the UK is an island, and we've been intrepid explorers and travellers all the time. And I'm so delighted that in the 20 years I've been in the industry, it has democratised. Mm. And being able to sell a holiday for £199, you know, self-drive for a week in an apartment, it's almost the same as we were paying in the 1980s. Yeah. And it is the economies of scale that have brought those kind of prices down. So it is, uh, <laughs> my fear, as Ed Lee says, is that it, it's likely to present, become the preserve of the wealthy. With the petition, uh, what are you guys hoping to achieve with it at this stage? Well, the more signatures we've got on it, the more chance I've got to be interviewed again by BBC or by IT, IT make pleas politicians and that's the only way that's left to us now is to put pressure on them mm. is to really in these final hours with Boris Johnson heading over to Brussels is to say number one a no deal is going to leave such a catastrophic and bad taste in everybody's mouths that you know a lot of companies in Europe will just not be well Brits will be at the end of the queue put it that way and I kind of understand why do not let that happen and already as you said with three weeks to go you know, we're trying to plan what's going to happen on, on the 1st of January. What? Mm. That's madness. <laughs> That's madness. You know, what is going to be the effect of border checks? Have all of our customers got passports that have six months validity on them? Have they all got adequate travel insurance? Because the e is not going to be honoured. It's not exist. It doesn't 
it, it just doesn't exist anymore. Mm. You know, um, phone companies have said that roaming charges will be kept the same. For how long is that going to last, I ask myself, mm. but there's money to be had in there. So um, how, how has the, the actual petition been received? Obviously, it, it's gained quite a bit of coverage, but um, what sort of engagements have you had with, with politicians and, um, and businesses? I think businesses get it because it doesn't matter what sector you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in travel or not. Any business that trades with Europe is now going, how many weeks to go? before we know whether we've got forms to fill out to export our alarm systems, which is my neighbour across the road. We were standing on the fence the other day and he said, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing on the first day I'm shipping my goods over. So, you know, it feels madness that we, we let ourselves get to this stage. But, you know, what I asked the, the Minister for Aviation the other day was the following. A pandemic is a once in a lifetime, totally unpredictable event. We knew a pandemic of some kind was coming because people have been modelling it for years now and said, oh, you know, we're kind of due one. But it's, it's utterly catastrophic. Now, why not delay the end of the transition period so that every economy in Europe can try and recover and, and stay trading in the face of what's winged all of us? Yes, it's true. The Germany's death rate, what are they heading at? 10,000? 10, 10,000? Mm. Their population is 72 million. We've got a population of 60 million, and we're heading towards 70,000 if you include excess deaths. So, you know, we're a service driven economy. Uh, not only are we also suffering the highest number of fatalities, we've been hit worse than, say, the German economy. Why not give our economies a chance to recover from this before we overlay the complexity? of trying to leave the EU, which is 40 years of legal entanglement and trading. Mm. And his answer was, was attitudes and said, well, we're going to deliver certainty. Mm. And I couldn't stop myself from saying, what, we have three weeks to go. Mm. We've barely well, got 14 working days to go. You, you just mentioned then actually um, the, uh, member, the, the secretary in charge of aviation uh, and, and that sort of thing. Who else in parliament have you talked with? Has anybody sort of voiced their support behind what you're doing? Well, the day before the lockdown in March, which was the 22nd of March, I was on a conference call with Nigel Huddleston, who's the Minister for Tourism. Um, we That quickly, we were highlighting the industry's issues with the pandemic and saying, you know what, if we're heading for Brexit and there is no deal yet and we don't know what's coming, you're causing us to, at that stage, we just brought back, we calculate as an industry, about 30,000 people from Europe. So, from Ski World's point of view, on Saturday the 14th of March, I flew back to the UK mm. on a plane that had brought hundreds of our customers out and we had a total of a thousand customers that had just arrived on the 14th. This, this was the um, chaotic weekend where the French said that they wouldn't close the resorts and then they did. Correct, <laughs> correct. So our customers were sitting in their chalets. I was in Sainsbury's in Tooting, which bizarrely I haven't been to since March because I'm looking after an elderly mother so I have to be really careful. Uh, and I, I get a call saying, despite what they've told us last week, the French results are going to have to shut down because they've become cognizant of really serious infection rates sweeping the country. So our guests and staff were sitting down eating whilst President Macron was saying, that's it, toast. So in that week from the 14th of March until Saturday the 21st, the ski industry repatriated all of those customers and most of our staff, so that for us it was about 260 staff. And we had chalets with food in the freezer, crumbs on the table. It was just like, you know, a ghost city. And then the core team that were left behind had to travel down and make those properties safe and shut them down and return them to owners whilst those restrictions were in place. So when we met with the Minister of Tourism on that Sunday, we were explaining that there was no way we were going to be able to refund all of our customers whose holidays had been cancelled, which for us was nearly a thousand bookings, in 14 days. 
which was required of us in the package travel regulations, because all of your money transfer systems are secure and encrypted in one direction. For the very reason, that's how you deliver security for cred taking credit card payments or online credit card payments or bank transfers. They all go in one way. It's like a river flowing that way with several sluice gates to stop the water going back up, which is how you keep your system secure. So how were we going to return all that money to all that number of bookings in 14 days? It was not going to happen. Yes, 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 I get it. The other thing we knew the industry was facing was chargebacks from credit cards, customers immediately instigating chargebacks, which then adds to your workflow because you've got to fight the chargeback. Mm. Takes six weeks to go through. Anyway, so at that stage, he seemed very cognizant of the issues and said he was going to take them to the other two departments that are involved. Now, here is the key thing to understand is that you know, tourism, inbound and outbound, is not only DCMS, which is Department of Culture, Media and Sport, it's BASE, which is Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, it's Ministry of Transport, and it's the Treasury. So the Minister for Tourism in the hierarchy of those ministers is pretty low down. And every time we're talking to those individual ministers, they tell us the government is doing something, they tell us they're hearing, and yet it was not until August that the CAA put on their website that they were acknowledging our right to give customers a note and refund them later than 14 days. Well, by that time, every single one of our customers had been refunded. What you've just explained is, you know, it's, it's quite insightful to the actual procedure and also the, 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 the sheer scale of the challenges that, that you were facing in a, in a very short time period. Well, you know, overlaid on top of that, which is what I made the Minister of Aviation aware of only this week, and he didn't seem to be, was we've refunded our customers and we have not been refunded by the airlines, mm -hmm. and we've not been refunded by 70% of our suppliers in Europe. So those chalet owners that we've paid in advance, and you might ask yourself, why do you pay in advance? Well, the answer is simple. It enables us to leverage down the price. You know, it's that classic thing, if you go to a hotel and say, how much does that room cost for a week? Which is what sites like booking.com will do. And the owner will give you a price. And they might move it up and down according to demand. But if you go to that owner and say, can I have five rooms for a week, please? You get a different price. And then if you say, can I have five rooms for the whole season? You do not expect to be paying the same price as you would for one room for one week. And that is how tour operators work. And when you're a well-financed tour operator, you make payment during the season in advance to those owners so that they can meet their mortgage um, requirements and that is how you deliver incredible value to your customers and packaging those things up. So companies like Ski World, we have not been refunded by the airlines, we have not been refunded by most of our chalet owners and yet we've had to refund our customers in cash. Yeah. So um, in the midst of all that, you know, having to suddenly turn the office over into remote working and furloughing because we had no money coming in, we were just trying to reverse that river so that we could start refunding customers. And, you know, mixed feelings about the man, but Michael O'Leary summed it up when he did a TV interview and said, just tell me, how am I going to refund a million customers in 14 days? Yeah. And, but what was happening, I think, in, in March and April is this was a terrifying new situation for all of us. You know, we were all confined to home. We all knew there was a virus out there. I, w I was in tears over the, the figures of deaths every evening as we kind of huddled watching the television. Shockingly, I'm seeing figures of three and 400 people a day dying in the UK from this virus, and I'm not crying anymore. And I remind mm. myself how, how desensitized I've come to those average figures which aren't even you know, news headlines. So we're still in the midst of a, of a crisis. But in March, it was causing our customers, despite the fact that by booking through a bonded operator, had we failed, the CAA would have refunded those customers 100%. Yeah. That was immaterial to them at the time. They wanted their holiday money back, and they knew that legally they were entitled to it in 14 days. Mm -hmm. But you show me any company that has the right security measures for the transfer of money, you show me any company that can reverse a thousand bookings in 14 days, and I'm going to tell you, 
that their, their mechanisms for transporting or transferring money are not secure. Now, the problems that you've just mentioned are actually some of the direct reasons that have been given in a letter written by, um, I believe it's either the owner or the director of Alpine Elements, who joined the growing list now of, of holiday ski holiday companies going into administration before this season ha- has even really started or can start. In the UK, we see a lot of ads saying, you know, make sure you're getting ready for, for life after Brexit. Um, one question I've sort of had that I thought would be good to pose is that what can seasonal workers and, um, you know, pe- businesses working in seasonal travel, what can they do to get ready for life after Brexit? Number one, join ESPIT if you're not already, because we do regular kind of tutorials as to what the situation is with operating a business in France, what you might need to do with payroll, um, yeah, putting you in touch with French accountants. Um, We only had one a couple of weeks ago where we had about 80 different companies joining in. So that would be the first thing, because there is strength in numbers, the group that runs it is all of us who volunteer our time, we, we, we cover expenses, that's it, and we try to construct the membership fee so that they're as fair and as low as we possibly can. So, you know, even this time now is, is kind of on top of my normal day work, so to speak, because I really believe in what I'm doing. So that would be the first thing. I think second thing, season heirs just know that for the last four years, we've really been trying to get the year of government and fight, and we're down to the last few hours. Again, I know it sounds you know, a simple thing, but please go on and sign up the petition and share it because I'm much more powerful in getting airtime with the media and doing what my current job is, which is putting our politicians under pressure and holding those muppets to account. Mm-hmm. Sorry, did that slip out? But um, I'm much more powerful in doing that if I know I've got a large number of signatures behind representing those season heirs. Yeah. Short of that, I would say as a season heir, you know, just check and ask questions of the company that you're going to be working for because more than ever, it's going to be really important that you work for a company that has all its ducks in a row. You know, if a company is not got you on a French payroll in 21, 22, you know, the following season, if they are then inspected, um, I don't know what the sanction would be for an employee, probably the biggest sanction would be for the employer, but at the very least it will do is cut your season short. Mm. So just make sure that you know something about the companies that you're working for. And yeah, you know, I've watched colleagues around me lose their jobs and companies fold and we've had ski weekends and alpine elements go, but there is talk of them kind of resurrecting and I've got kind of question marks around that Mm. because they're leaving the CAA to refund all their customers. Well, that slightly hurts because we've, we're running ourselves into debt at Ski World, you know, we're applying for a loan, but we've pulled on all of our reserves and we're a highly capitalised company. But it's kind of not fair that we are refunding our customers in good faith and applying to the law and those other companies might be phoenixing, as I understand it's called. VIP, those are teams of people that are amazing and I'm desperately sad they've gone out of business. Fundamentally good company. And it makes me angry. When I hear politicians say, well, you know, it's the survival of the fittest, Mm. what, in a pandemic, really? And two years had its second bailout from the German government. Mm. You know, European governments, and even in France, they're supporting their travel industries far better than we are in the UK because they look at the figures and not at the politics. They are saying travelling for people is an industry that contributes to the whole of our economy, and they're recognising it. And I just do not understand why in this country there's been such an absence of talk about it and an absence of support. You mentioned then how some of the European countries are supporting the tourism and the travel companies well in comparison to to here in Britain. Just explain how big the the British holiday industry is. How much does it generate? Uh, You know, how important is it? Oh, gosh, well... I quote that figure of £34.3 billion contribution to the economy, Mm. and that figure actually dates from, I think, 2016, and I've seen the figures now for 2019, and it went up to £37 billion contribution to the economy. That's in the UK. That's spend in the UK, and that isn't just customers buying sun cream 
or paying a holiday company for their ski trip or their summer trip. That's all the additional expenditure in generating sales, all our marketing, all the IT, all the things that I mentioned before. So it's substantial. Directly, it employs about 215,000 people. Let me change the tense of that. It employed directly 215,000 people. Indirectly, between 400 and 500,000. That's approaching half a million people because those are the people who now we've cut contracts with SEO advisors and with photographers and you know people that we pay fairly regularly. We're not making that spend. So you know those people were indirectly employed by companies like Ski World. Mm. And just in outbound activity leisure, the figures that we had was we contributed about 16.5 billion to the economy. Um, and a percentage of that, you know, 1.5 billion of that is directly to the exchequer in taxes and employment. So we're a substantial industry and, you know, I don't feel there's been a voice like there has been for Airlines UK, which has a very powerful lobbying presence in Parliament. And often people confuse an airline with a tour operator. Um, so, you know, I can sit here and say we've refunded our, all of our customers and I can say our airlines have not refunded us. And instead they've offered credit in some cases, no credit in other cases. And that's a different sector and they're heavily represented. Whereas our voice really isn't represented considering the kind of figures that I've given you there. Mm. Let's talk about visas and work permits because obviously this is at the core actually of what the petition is about. Um, and we were actually talking about this prior to the interview. Um, this is one possible scenario, obviously, of what might happen po post post Brexit. Um, and I mentioned to you that you know my experiences uh, doing seasonal work in Japan and uh, to a lesser extent in Turkey did require a visa as a procedure. It was fairly straightforward, a little bit of a financial cost, but in my eyes, no problem. Talk us through the concerns that you guys have of visas and work permits for seasonal work in Europe. Okay, well, the, the first thing is, let's talk about the thing you mentioned for cost. That currently, anybody, or say last season, anybody who wanted to work a season for us had only their contract to fill out in the way of paperwork. We had only a SIPC declaration to make and an A1 to obtain. That's the, the responsibility of the tour operator. And insurance to arrange. That was it. Incredibly streamlined. And we all know from a business point of view, the more streamlined something is, actually the, the less expensive it is to run, the more efficient it is. So the first thing is any interruption to that, which there will be, is going to increase administrative costs just the cost of applying for visas. Now, Ski World used to employ about 460 overseas staff. Post the referendum, it diminished to about 250 people. But still, we had to, as an employer, sponsor 250 people. I'm probably needing to double the size of the overseas team in order to do that. That's a cost to the company. Now, the other thing about those visas is, as non-Europeans now, you would have to apply for two visas. One is a work visa, and the other one is a long-stay visa, because you can only stay for 90 days in any one year. So already, if you do a ski season, and then you either want to take a summer holiday, you're getting close to, to running out of how long you can spend outside of the UK. Mm. And, I, and not many people know that. You know, they've thought that their ability to take long summer or winter holidays is going to stay the same. It's not. So there's a requirement for two visas. And once you say it's a visa, a visa can be turned down. And the example that we've had when we were trying to get visas for our chalet host to work in the States, there's a couple. Um, we could take it on because we only had a few chalets, so you know we could manage all of that. And uh, one of them was turned down and the other one was accepted, which meant their season was over because they wanted to go together. So a visa application process is just that, it's an application. It doesn't guarantee you a visa. And if there are additional costs, which there will be, um, on top of the admin cost of processing it, who's going to bear those costs? Mm. And you know, one of the things we were talking about is, you know, I really understand when we were talking to the French about 
um, to the super trader in, in Abbeville about trying to put in place a faster visa process. And he said, well, who's going to pay for it? Because we didn't vote to leave. And I get it. I really get it. If there is a cost to Brexit, you know, it's the UK economy that's going to bear it. Mm. Because we decided to leave. Why should they pay for a computer system or additional staff to process visas? Now, this was a conversation with a man, this, uh, you know, the super prefet in Albeville, who is so cognizant of the value of the UK tour operators bring to the Alps that I'd almost say he's one of us. We, we wrote a report you know, showing the millions of pounds we contribute to the French ski economies. And the very first meeting we sat down and I said to him, um, you know, have you had a chance to read our report? And he looked me in the eye and very slowly and very measured said, Madame, every single word. And what he was signalling at the very opening of our first meeting was, I know the value to our local economies and I'm going to do all I can. And he has. But if you go to a local authority, if you go to Wandsworth and you say, you know what, there's a little enclave down there in Fursdown, which is where I live, and I know it's the law, but that little group there would actually not like to wear seat belts when mm. they're driving around first town. Yeah. Well, it's a national law, so his hands are tied. It's, it, at the moment, the requirement is for two visas, and although he knows what we bring to the economy, he can't break the law. Mm. For, for our views out of interest, who, who is this person within in that region, within France? Well, he's going to change soon. Okay. But Préfet is the, the central French government's local representative. Uh, you know, he is the, the political and administrative head of the area, and the direct, which is the work inspectors, currently report in to the super mm. So, you know, he is the person who can um, not exactly govern, but guide work inspectors. So it's pretty significant when he's on your side saying, I really understand the challenges that mm. you're facing. There are quite a lot of British holidaymakers and British businesses and, and managers and workers that are, are located within the Fren French Alps but I think it's quite quite positive to acknowledge that you know they they can recognize the importance of, of that and I think all the protests that have taken place within the Tarantes Valley also uh, have also added to that um, there's obviously a lot of concern about what what the 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 future is going to hold for this season and beyond with the restrictions. But sticking to um, post Brexit, I wanted to talk about potentially another scenario because I was I was looking back at um, some of the other key developments within um, the winter sports industry in the last couple of years, um, and Switzerland was quite a, a one that I, I I took notice of because um, they a few years ago levelled the the minimum wage for seasonal workers had to be the same for the as those who work full-time within Switzerland so potentially that could be one way that maybe EU countries go so so wouldn't that lead to a better quality of life for seasoners possibly if they can get in because mm. we have this exactly the same problems that stepping outside of the EU we do not have the automatic right to work. We have to have those people licensed and registered. And above all, we have to have advertised for a minimum of, I think it's six weeks, could be six or eight weeks, and prove that a local person could not have that job. Mm. So, you know, wages aside, and wages are, you know, a, a kind of a regulatory and a market force issue, it's actually being able to get in there in the first place. That's the big thing. And what we're trying to do is say to politicians in these final hours, it would only cost you the ink on your pen to do a youth mobility scheme, mm. which is a period to come in and a period to come out that doesn't require that, isn't an application process. And as long as you've got a return ticket, um, you could go and, and work. You, you mentioned about locals um, and, you know, I've, I've heard a couple of people speak to me actually and say, you know, are, are are these jobs actually rather than disappear, are they just going to be taken up by um, in English speaking or or non English speaking local residents within the European countries, say from like Belgium or, or Netherlands? Um, I guess my question from that, having worked seasons in the last few years, is that I don't 
recall seeing those people lining up round the block for those jobs? No, and you're absolutely right. One of the things I have to say is that the the two MPs for the Savoie and the Haute Savoie, um, one of them is, is a chap called Vincent Roland, um, who really, really gets an, uh, the impact of British drill operators in the mountain to the extent that he's recently tabled his second question about it in Parliament. So he's been present in you know most of our meetings. When we went to um, Paris to meet some, the, you know, the, to meet representatives of the French government, basically, Vincent was was with us, and um, he his opening argument was this: We are well aware of, and the French term is a penurie de main d'oeuvre, which is a shortage of labour. And I remember those words because I didn't know the meaning of the word penury. <laughs> Quickly had my phone under the desk at this meeting in the Elysee <laughs> Palace, kind of, oh, holy hell, what's that mean? Um, and he opened the meeting to the French government saying, we are already aware of a shortage of workforce in our mountain regions. Now, you're right, the issues that the French face are the following. is just like we do with Brussels sprout picking in the UK. It's very seasonal work that goes from December until April. And... If you're lucky in established season A, you might go straight into a summer operation, then you might go straight back into a winter operation. But for a French person, what they see is actually working from December to April, and then my job ends. That's it. Mm. They don't. That. The other key consideration is, you know, and I speak from personal experience. You know, I've done chalet hosting and repping and resort management, and you know, one minute I'm cleaning one of the eight bathrooms in the property. And the next minute, I'm finishing off the, the afternoon tea and cake and acting as a chef in the evening. That job, when you advertise it in France, does not exist. Sure. French people will be looking for a cleaner or for somebody who's um, hosting or a chef. Mm. And the other thing, the whole concept of us Brits of going traveling for a year, you know, um, that for a while, the, 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 the word in French for, um, you know, a gap year was uh, a gap year. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> they, they it. It. yeah. They, because it, it, the phenomena is, is just not the same. Mm. And because they're a country that has some of the, you know, most amazing ski resorts in, on the planet, uh, French people have had it at their doorstep all the time. So they will not give up a job or finish university and go, oh, I'm going to go, go and do a ski season. Yeah. If they did, they don't know what the job of a chalet host is. Mm. It just doesn't. And the people that we did interview and speak to, when we found those whose English was good enough, and there weren't a large number of them, they just could not get their head around this mixture of roles that mm. we all do. So, yeah. other town English. And I think as well it's worth pointing out that obviously um, British holidaymakers have a how to how shall we say a certain standard of customer service um and if you're a uk uh seasonal worker someone who go, goes out and does it um you bring a whole lot with you you bring obviously passion for the mountains the the desire to you know be out your comfort zone and, and meet meet new people but having come from there you also sort of kind of know or you get trained to to know how to deliver that level of of service um you know whether with the french not understanding those roles whether they would be able to um you know acclimatize to to that it is questionable i'd say yeah we we said in our lobbying efforts in in paris you know what we called it was culturally compatible service mm. you know and the same is true when i was speaking to the md of intrepid travel you know they have um people from Sweden, France, Germany coming to the UK and looking after groups of the same nationality. And she said, you know, the huge advantage, even if we did find someone who spoke Swedish fluently, and we do find fluent German speakers, is that when they come over from the country, they bring over their understanding of the cultural norms mm. for that country. And of course, we can find people that have that in the UK. And of course, you know, I'm sure we will be able to find French people who have that understanding, but in the kind of numbers that we need, that's going to be tough. And mm. with this role, which doesn't really exist in French or Spanish or German culture, 
So the, the chalet provision is going to change substantially unless we have um, some kind of uh, use mobility visa. Yeah, there's, a, the, there's definitely a, a number of questions around the chalet, chalet market, especially the catered chalet market moving forward. Um, so one of the other questions I was, I was saying is we've talked about a couple of specific scenarios or challenges there. Are there any other challenges that you feel are worth highlighting that seasonaires and travel businesses could face post-Brexit? Well, I think travel businesses, we wrote a report which you know we circulated and got some publicity for and sent to government in 2018. Um, saying one of the other huge losses of our innovative, enormous travel industry is the shortening of, of um, leases. Now, what that means is for a ski operator, you know, we very, very rarely prior to 2016 signed a lease on a property for, for a year because the cost of putting it on your website, the cost of setting it all up, you actually wanted to sign for three, five, or seven years, or in some cases, 10 years. Mm. Now, interestingly, a company like Eurocamp, who are also members of ESPIT, do the same with their emplacement, you know, with their, what do you call them, their sites, you know, um, in uh, French campsites. They would go to uh, an owner of a campsite and say, we'll have three pitches. That's what you call it in English, isn't it? You have three pitches. Uh, we'd like to take uh, three of those or five of those for the next three summers, please. Because then you put it on your website, you produce your direct marketing material, you've got that longevity. But also, it goes back to a point I made earlier about your negotiating power with that supplier. Mm. So um, what we found was after 2016, both summer and winter, UK tour operators just were not signing contracts of any length. That has started to filter through to prices because we cannot leverage down the prices like we used to. The other thing that will filter through is we used to use that to get the ski and ski out property or to work with the owners who we knew we could develop a property with or say in Eurocamp's case to get some of the nicest in plasma or the nicest pictures on a campsite. Yeah. So UK tour travellers would then you know look at Eurocamp's website or Ski World's website and see an amazing exclusive collection which was a bit like us rolling our towels out on the sun lounger before the Germans get there. You know, we bagged the best places and we were prepared to put our money where our mouth is. Yeah. So the two things that are already filtering through to the travel industry, and I'll come on to flights in a second, is that prices are going up. We estimated for a lot of tour operators, the net effect of that lost negotiating power would be a 30, 30 a 30% increase in prices. Now, as a tour operator, your job is to try and streamline things and not pass that on because as soon as you do, your market's going to diminish because it's going to put it out of the price range of many people. Mm. But that was the kind of estimated increase in cost that we were facing. Plus, if a German tour operator comes along or a Danish tour operator, mind you, I've just heard two of those have gone out of business, but anyway, um, and says to the owner, well, I'll, book, I'll, I'll rent it for three years suddenly you've lost what you've been offering the UK market, which is that pitch on that campsite that it was in the best place, under a tree, away from the toilets, you know, all of those kind of things. So that's the first thing. The other thing I worry about with the travel industry is we've been really bitten with some of our airline contracts, um, you know, not having been refunded by EasyJet, having to try and secure credit, which is just you know, a nightmare. I don't know how many charter operators there are going to be out there. Mm. I can see EasyJet and British Airways doing is mothballing their fleets. They are putting flights out, and it's happened to friends of mine that you'll book at 12 o'clock to, I don't know, Palmer, and EasyJet will have two flights during the day, find that they're both half full. Previously, they might have run those, now they're consolidating them. Before you know it, you get a notification that the 12 o'clock flight you had is not going until 3 o'clock in the afternoon or it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Because I understand that they're desperate for any income and they've got to consolidate and, and keep costs down as much as they can. Mm. But I think all travel companies are, for the next couple of years, going to be facing much reduced flying programs. And in the event of a no deal, the open skies arrangement that we had, which gave rise to EasyJet and Ryanair being incredibly powerful, you ready? UK-based airlines 
was that we could take those planes from London to Reykjavik to um, Marbella to Grenoble and then back to London. Um, but when you're not part of the EU, you have to go back to the home country. Mm. So Swiss Air would have to go from London to uh, from Geneva to London and then back to Geneva again. And I don't know what is going to be negotiated in a deal if there is one about European skies and open skies. I've heard that we're going to have some access to it, but observing over the last five to six years in particular, um, the the market for budget ski holidays all inclusive very 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 cheap getting everything in one um and also you know the rise of say big young groups like university ski trips i know those have 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 boomed in recent years um take for example as well for a budget company someone like sun sunweb who are you know now one of the top companies within france for ski holidays i mean how do you see that affect affecting that side of the market well there will always be budget holidays in January. You know, what we and somewhere, because we use the same suppliers, pay for an apartment in January will always be low mm. because the French market doesn't travel in January. Yeah. Now, somewhere and us pay the same prices in February, which are a lot, lot higher. Now, UK tour operators, in taking a season-long risk for a chalet or in some cases a hotel, What we did was we relied on the income in February and we actually sold holidays at a loss in January. Mm. So a lot of those last minute deals and those budgets were because I was looking at the figures and I'm on the algorithm that calculates it and says, if that plane leaves, that's cost me £200. If that chalet bed goes empty, that's cost me, say, £700. If I sell it for £499, I've halved my losses. So that model of paying up front for that commitment, paying up front for your charter plane, allowed you to sell holidays at a loss because you calculated there were other times of year you'd make a profit. The apartments are doing the same. That's why their prices are so low in January and so high in February, is they're doing exactly the same thing. Hmm. So when there is a that phenomenon going on and possibly an oversupply in the market, actually you can pick up some amazing deals. Now let's look at where we are now. I don't know, aside from Ski World, which chalet operators of any size, perhaps with Ski with 33 chalets, mm. are going to be left for 21, 22. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking at. Now, I'm also asking the same question. Is a, a Norwegian going to make it? What's going to happen? How many planes are they going to be out there to charter? So there's always going to be bargains. And I think, you know, in 21, 22, we've got a self-drive holiday to an apartment, actually I think it might be March rather than January, for about £167 for a week. So they, you, know, you can't stop me selling, can you? It's no. Kind of <laughs> but, you know, those prices will still be around, but the volume of late deals um, is going to be, certainly for the all-inclusive model, reduced. They'll still be there, but not in the same volume. Yeah. Now we're going to go to uh, the questions from the viewers. So we'll start first with a question from Dan. Now, Dan works for Snow Drones Transfers, so obviously a transfer company. Um, if people wanted to get involved with the ESPIT lobby group, how would they be able to go about doing that? Speak to your boss, Dan, because your boss is on our core group. <laughs> okay. All right. And your, both your bosses, Al and Helen, are active participants in uh, ESPIT and have been feeding a lot of information to the group. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is, aside from signing our petition, I know I've said that before, but do you know what? Do not underestimate the value of writing to your MP because an MP, when you write to them, has a, 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 a I think it's a legal obligation to reply or acknowledge. Yeah. And if you write to your MP and they happen to be a Conservative MP, you know what you need to say is you were the party for business. Actually, you're now being driven by ideology and I'm paying the price in terms of my job and my future prospects. Yeah. But he happens to be working for an organisation which has been big participators in ESPIT. So well done. Oh, good. Well, that's good for Dan to know. Um, and just to let everybody know, the viewers, I will put a link to the petition 
in the description of the video at, at the end of this um, so they can access that once they've finished watching the video. Um, and actually, yeah, I was going to mention that as well, writing to your MP. Um, what I would say is that, you know, that you might think that's only one letter. Yeah. But what you might not know is what if a hundred people wrote? In other words, you might feel like you're a drop in the ocean, but it's an ocean plus a drop and you don't know where else it's raining. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and, and, worth it. Yeah, and I'd echo as well, you know, you mentioned some of the departments that, that the industry revolve around. It's, it's worth writing to those people as well. Alex from Global Seasonaires Network. Um, is there anything that people seeking work later on this season can do to put themselves in a better position to get employment this winter? Apply to a UK tour operator and see if you can get them to get you an A1 now. That's an A1 but, visa? Uh, no, it's um, a recognition that you've got a national insurance number in this country. Okay. Um, because that is what um, will probably enable you to try and get a job um, in France if there, or in any part of Europe if there is any part of a ski season to be had. Uh, but as from the 1st of January, and you, without that, and working for a tour operator, I don't know how you go about getting a job mm. in the that would be my only thought. And it has to be by the 31st of December. So mm -hmm. apply to a UK tour operator who has operations as quickly as you can. Yeah, I suppose it's worth point highlighting that point, actually, that if by some miracle um, you're able to actually get work b and be out in Europe before the 31st of December, you won't require a visa. But afterwards, who, who, who knows? Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Andy from Snow Camps Europe. Um, I think he's got he, he's got two he, two here, so I'll just read them out as as one. Do you think the petition will achieve anything? And how do you know that so many people will lose the right to work in Europe as nothing has been decided yet, and there are many other countries outside of the EU that can easily work in the EU by gaining a seasonal work permit? didn't understand the second part of that question, but the first part, what do we hope to achieve, is I think literally by writing something into the agreement that says there should be a youth mobility scheme allowing young people to go back and forwards for a defined period of time would is our best chance of keeping seasonal work going. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Now, the second thing is, you know, at the moment, Europe is, is working together. All those countries in Europe are working together. And once we leave the EU, what they are saying is that you have to have an arrangement with each individual country. So, for example, if you wanted to go and work in, I don't know, Italy, Italy may have a scheme that allows a certain number of non-EU citizens mm. to go and work in their ski resorts. But the first thing I'd say is if that's the case, you're up against every other nationality in doing that yeah. and there's probably still going to be some form of application process to go through. Mm. I think the final thing I would say is, is just like summer campsites, we, we've said the obvious, but ski seasons are highly seasonal and have this short, intense requirement for labour, so there probably will be opportunities but they'll be relatively small. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe like what what andy was alluding to in the second question is on the fact that you know the eu will will already have arrangements with countries outside the eu for their people to come come and work as well um and i know actually funnily enough uh, looking into switzerland a little bit earlier earlier they've said that they're going to be releasing three and a half thousand work permits for british citizens so that they can come and work with in, in in their country so i mean maybe we might see um more seasonal jobs return maybe to to switzerland who knows um but i hope that answers answers andy's question um yeah, and, say is that, and if you're you know if you're listening there is still likely to be an application process to mm. go through there is still likely to be a number and the application process at the moment for those is a few months you know, at best, we've got it down to three months. So for three months, you're not entirely certain that's the case. And you're up against, you know, other nationalities most of the time. So you're right, we don't know yet. Yeah. And we are modelling on what we think is the best case scenario, which is pretty much what you've described, but no certainty. 
I think a fast track might be a, a, a good one. I mean, I mean, obviously, given the importance of these jobs and um, given actually the, the recruitment for many of the companies starts in June, but does continue as late as October. And obviously you have dropouts as well. Um, potentially maybe that be a, uh, might be a way, f- a way forward um, mo- moving on. Okay, next question, uh, Joe. Um, this is this is a friend of mine who who was who I've worked seasons with. Has said, "Have you had any idea what percentage of seasonal jobs from UK workers will be lost?" At least fifty. At least fifty percent. What's that? Well, I mean, what <laughs> do you want to elaborate? Uh, yeah, I tell you, as a, a sales and marketing person, it's my job to um, check out competitors. I spend most of my time doing it. So I have the very interesting task of reading through spreadsheets and working out how many beds Frithville have, um, how many um, staff they might need in resort to service that number of beds. I do the same with Ingham's. Now, at that point, after Ski World and Le Ski, I'm beginning to struggle to name UK tour operators who will Im- be employing UK citizens in any number. Ski World was one of the largest, and we're half the size we were. You know, our London office had around 50 people in it this time last year. Well, we're less than half of that at the moment, and most of them are on furlough. There is no money coming into the business. There are no bookings happening. Yeah. Customers that we've got booked for the 2021 20, season, this season, we're either giving them their money back or deferring them to later in the season or next year at best. So, um, you know, when I look at the demise of VIP, who had as many chalets as we do, I look at Crystal saying that they're not operating chalets anymore, that they'll have resort staff, but they'll do a lot of e-repping. And of course, they're part of TUI, which is a European company. So you can expect your Crystal holiday to be, you know, repped by somebody with a European passport who isn't perhaps, you know, mother tongue. I'm kind of asking myself the question, how many of us are left standing? Mm. There are not that many. So, uh, you know, I think I can be pretty accurate saying it's at least 50% fewer jobs. Will has got um, two here. Um, we've, we've obviously mentioned visas quite a bit. He says, do you think it is likely the British citizens will need a visa to work seasonal jobs in France? As things stand, yes. Okay. Um, now, it's he's... Not- it's definite. Yeah. As we stand at the moment, yes. Okay. Um, for this winter season, what's left of it, we, we can operate on A1s if we can get them in time uh, and get people registered in time. Mm. But um, unless there is something in a deal, um, that is fact. Yeah. Follow up. How would you get a visa if you are self-employed in Britain and France? Will's girlfriend is a winter sports athlete who is self-employed in Britain, but also does work for ESF. Okay, it would depend. In France, you, I've forgotten the term, it's auto entrepreneur, I think is the term that's applied for self-employed. And you have to register in France as an auto entrepreneur. And it's can take anything from a month to three or four months for that to happen with quite a lot of paperwork to submit. So I would assume if she's already working for ESF that she's got that. Now, if they were married, um, and sorry to put any pressure on the couple that might be listening, um, it might be an easier process that if she's already registered in France, he would be able to go over on a spousal visa. But I'm, I'm not ginned up enough to know if, like in the UK, there is a requirement even for spouses, you know, coming from America, India, France, from now on, uh, whether there's a minimum salary requirement or if you have to have a job before you come over. Mm. So I couldn't answer in detail on that one, I'm afraid. Yeah. Might have to look at one into that a bit more yourself there, Will. Um, okay, Shane, this is Shane, this is the final question has said can the industry survive if there is a lack of services due to a lack of seasonal staff? Lack of services. Does he? Well, the thing is, the industry is is a fraction of the size it was. Yeah. And you know, my sense, being really frank, and I, I haven't said this, you know, in any TV and radio interviews, is that we've got the travelling public over here, 
who are still going to be wanting to book catered chalets and still wanting to be met at the airport and guided and have somebody English speaking in the resort when they get there. And we are so used to responding to the market. Now, I think we are now much smaller as a number of bonded operators giving customers the financial security that we will refund them if we cancel the holiday. But I don't know whether demand will outstrip supply mm. or have the ravages of the pandemic made people less willing to spend on a ski holiday and more conservative and the worst case scenario out of a job. So when he says lack of services, you know, my instinct at the moment is there may be more people looking for holidays, certainly chalet holidays, than there are on offer in 21-22. Yeah. So, um, and the other thing is, you know, if we can't employ people, which if there is no deal, that's certain, from the UK, we are of course going to have, we already have a French company at Ski World and we've been advising quite a few members of ESPIT to do the same. We will be trying to employ Europeans, which hurts me. I love giving jobs, you know, the same opportunities that I enjoyed. And hey, I'm going to be giving them perhaps to European 18 to 34 year olds yeah. as opposed to British 18 to 34 year olds. But we may have to slightly remodel the chalet concept. So, you know, with youth unemployment across Europe being um, particularly high, I think we won't be short of people, but it's what kind of service that we will be offering. Yeah, um, I think I think you're right on that point there. That you know, actually, I think despite the pandemic, it's it's been quite clear that that there is a demand for holidays, and with the inability for people to actually go out on holidays right now, that demand is, is actually probably building and building. Um, and there is fears that when it when it does become possible to do so, there might be a bit of a an overload. Um, and I think that's partly part of the reason why many EU countries wanted a joined up approach to keeping the ski resorts closed and, until the new year when they've agreed. Um, but it's interesting that you, you you say particularly, obviously, that you know people will still may still want to go. On the on the chalets, it gives them obviously privacy and security, but also that that in level of independence and quality of a of a stay. But there might not be the chalets that they're, they're after. Well, they're being more expensive because you know a good example is we used to buy seventy seven thousand liters of wine. Wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah. That gave us some buying power. That mm. gave us some buying power. Well, you know that figure is going to be. A fraction of that in future so mm. my my fear is that chalet holidays will become the preserve of the wealthy like they were when i started going back to you know our manifest in the 80s we had a separate section for lord and lady and viscount and you know hrh in a few yeah. places that, that was the type of people that were staying in chalets um i do think there will be demand what i'm really concerned about is that at the moment what stops everybody going is you know it isn't solely the fact that the lifts aren't open, is we've got FCDO advice against all but essential travel. Right, yeah. What you have to remember is that currently that invalidates most insurance policies. So the other work that ESPIT has been doing is trying to lobby the insurance industry. But if you think FCDO advice in the past when it said all but essential travel to Yemen, yeah, that makes sense because you're going to get a bullet in the head if you're in Yemen. So that it, it, the only policies that cover you, I think there's one called Battle Day, <laughs> that cover you for going against FCDO advice well, for precisely that kind of scenario. Now we've got FCDO advice saying, you know, don't go to France. And insurance companies are going, well, you know, we, we, we're not going to cover you. There's a few emerging yeah. now, yeah. but it's not a coherent market. And mm -hmm. if I'm finding it hard to navigate, then goodness knows our customers are. So... You know, um, that's one consideration. If you're thinking of going skiing in January onwards, what you've got to remember is your e-hit card, as things stand, remember, is not valid. You are not entitled to the same health care in France that you used to. So you need to make sure your policy covers you. Um, and the other thing is, what is the state of that FCDO advice? Until that is, is refined or lifted, um, your insurance could be in jeopardy. 
I think that's a really good point to end on actually that you know when you know when it does become if for some reason you on a technical reason you can get out to a resort you know maybe you say take Switzerland now which technically sort of is uh, um, possible to go and ski make sure you check everything before you go I mean a lot of people are saying that they won't go actually purely for that reason because you know their insurance won't cover them and if you have an accident on the slopes um, you are going to be in, in very deep deep trouble so um, that, that's a really good one to sort of uh, point out and make people aware is there anything any sort of message that you want to end on anything maybe positive for season airs and seasonal businesses coming from from SBIT so the first thing I'm going to say is you know I had a conversation with an ex season air who I was lining up for a BBC interview and I was chatting to him and I said you know it's really oh no that's right he said to me um, am I going to need a visa you know in 21 22 and I went yes of course and he said oh he said is it that Brexit thing that's kind of passed me by and and I thought you you don't know the significance to your own future and actually you're already a season air and you you didn't you didn't vote, which is what he told me afterwards. So the first thing I would say is, you know, please, in this world of, of fragmented news and, you know, fake news on, on social media, just remember one thing, is that you need to keep on voting. You really must. That's the first thing. Because ESPIT would not be here were it not for the efforts of people doing that. Okay. The next thing is, for a season air, just know that the interests of me personally, all the ESPIT core group, um, who are all, by the way, ex-seasonaires, is to try and preserve the opportunities that we all had because we can see what it has brought to our businesses. Secondly, you know, quite frankly, I'm fighting for my livelihood and the livelihoods of everybody at Ski World. Every time I make a TV interview or I do something, I'm thinking, I have to raise the profile of this industry. I have to do something about it. Mm. So I'm, as I said, I'm naturally a glass half full. And I would say just write to your MPs and, and do those things, sign the petition, because don't underestimate. You might go, oh, it's a drop in the ocean, but remember, it's an ocean plus a drop. Again, Diane, thank you very much for coming on today. Huge pleasure. I love talking about my business in the industry, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Mm. And uh, thank you very much for watching today. Um, if you did enjoy this video, do remember to like and leave a comment. And finally, also subscribe to the channel. We'll be back with more content soon. But until now, guys, stay safe.